Hi, I'm Matt Natove, Executive Editor of Plastics Technology Magazine, and welcome to another Plastics Technology webinar presented today by W. Muller USA in Agawam, Massachusetts. And today's topic is Introduction to Multi-Layer Blow Molding to Promote Sustainability, Consumer Safety, and Profit. It is presented by Elijah Harris of W. Muller USA. Elijah is sales and marketing coordinator at this firm that is internationally very well known for its extrusion blow molding heads, both monolayer and multilayer. Elijah has been with W. Muller for two years. In fact, I met him at the K Show in Dusseldorf in 2019. Uh, before he gets started, I would note that if questions occur to you during the presentation, type them into your questions box at the bottom of the pane on the right of your screen. And um, now I'll turn the webinar over to Elijah. Yes, thank you so much, Matt, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, buenos dias, bom dia to all of our Latin American friends as well, and thank you for coming into our webinar today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the basics of our multi-layer extrusion blow molding technologies. Um, this is, uh, I think, a worthwhile presentation to give, especially at this time where packaging demand is so high due to COVID and other health and financial circumstances, uh, and it will allow any of the packaging design or reliability or sustainability oriented people in the crowd here to sort of get a good uh, starting ground on the multi-layer extrusion blow molding process and uh, help to build their knowledge so that they can follow up with a great number of questions. Uh, today's uh, presentation is, of course, uh, presented by Plastics Technologies, as well as the information is provided by the company I work for, W. Muller USA. Uh, it's a family-owned and operated company uh, based out of Troisdorf, Germany, for over 40 years, uh, known for legendary quality and reliability with, of course, as you've come to expect, 24-7 global support, service, spare parts, and totally custom and handmade products uh, made by the Muller family. So let's get right into the technical basics. So the goal of everybody in this audience, I should think, is to have or to create the perfect container, uh, one that you can produce easily and inexpensively, but commands great margins and value uh, due to what it adds to the finished product. It's a mainstay in catalogs um, and on the store shelves, for its reputation for having excellent properties or it's a necessity in niche applications. Uh, the perfect container has a pretty strict set of guidelines that it has to meet though. Uh, it has to be aesthetically appropriate. It has to have a high end feel, especially if it's in the cosmetic or personal care segments. Uh, it has to be durable enough to not only survive transportation, distribution and filling, um, but also the tolerances expected with its operation. Uh, so a milk jug, for example, has to last longer than the milk inside of it. And an automotive duct uh, can't melt when it gets up to the operating temperatures of the engine. It has to be protective. A plastic is the number one material for transporting things in part because of its non-reactive properties. Uh, but sometimes that alone isn't enough. Often you have to isolate your contents from the environment, such as UV light or oxygen through the use of barrier materials. Um, the perfect container has to be sustainable. It's not only morally correct to make your product in a way that preserves our environment, but it's also economically correct. Not only is making a bottle from recycled materials intrinsically less expensive, but consumers highly value sustainability when making purchasing decisions. As an example, one of our good partners, Unilever, recently announced that it would not uh, continue brands that don't meet strict sustainability goals and that its best-selling brands globally are usually the ones that incorporate more recycled materials into their packaging. And finally, it has to also be cost effective. Uh, the best way to drive profitability for your company is to bring your operating costs down. Uh, and everyone in the packaging supply chain, so manufacturers, distributors, converters, end users, brands, 
all expect to be able to have a margin on the packaging aspect of their product. So price increases from converters ripple all the way to the consumer and they impact their purchasing decisions. So having known all that uh, about the perfect container, a container consisting of just one material can't possibly uh, possess all of these characteristics. Most materials only have one or two of these characteristics at best. So for example, a, a container that's all virgin HDPE, which is high density polyethylene, is aesthetically pleasing, uh, but it's expensive, it's not very sustainable, it's incapable of isolating its contents, especially if they are aggressive or perishable. Uh, on the other side of the argument, a container made entirely out of PCR, which is post-consumer recycled material, is sustainable and inexpensive, uh, but also aesthetically displeasing, especially based on our current uh, process for evaluating and grading and sorting post-consumer recycled plastic resin. Uh, it's subject to re supply restrictions. You can only make as many materials as you have recycled material. Uh, and just like the virgin HDPE, uh, it's incapable of isolating its contents from the outside world. Another drawback if you had a container that was entirely PCR is that in often in cases of food or medicine, uh, there are restrictions that mean you can't directly contact the inside of the container uh, with recycled materials. A container made out of entirely barrier material faces even more problems, um, being aesthetically displeasing, massively expensive because these are some of the most expensive resins that you can buy, and being incredibly unsustainable based on their production process. Uh, so we need uh, a container that has multiple layers to be able to meet all of these positive characteristics and offset the negative characteristics of each of these different resins. Uh, take, for example, this six-layer bottle. It contains a virgin outer layer uh, for aesthetics, a PCR inner layer to help drive sustainability and cost savings, uh, two adhesive layers for durability, uh, a barrier layer to protect the contents of the container, and then an interior virgin layer that's non-reactive and approved for content with whatever is inside of the container. So now that we have this basic understanding of what we're trying to make, let's take a little bit of a look at how we make it. Uh, so this is just a rough drawing of one of our multi-layer extrusion heads that we design and fabricate here at W. Muller. Um, you need a multi-layered parison which is the plastic tube that comes out of the end of an extrusion head and into the mold to be able to make a multi-layered container. And this is a lot more complex than it might seem. So for example, this head, which is on display here, only has a single parison, um, but its intricately designed manifold has to place each layer uh, within the head uh, and its housings and its inserts so that it is formed correctly. Uh, you have to have a special control solution. You have to have all of your materials kept separately and kept at their optimal processing parameters. Uh, and even though they're all sort of mixing together in the same manifold and in the same housings, uh, you know, you have to make sure that they're coming into contact in a way that is conducive to what you're trying to do. And that's where having a head manufacturer with over 40 years of experience becomes necessary. Um, as you add more parisons and more layers, the complexity grows. Uh, you know, each extruder must feed into each parison with a consistent timing, temperature, and pressure across all of them. So, uh, you know, for a six-layer, eight-parison head, that's 48 different flow channels that have to sort of be milled and designed and carefully contracted into one manifold in a way that satisfies the consistent parameters across different distances and different substances. Uh, your uh, different materials are going to want to have different temperatures and residual times and pressures while they're in the processing, uh, while they're processing inside of the extrusion head. 
so you're going to want to be able to accurately control all of these parameters separately without impacting your other materials that you'll find in other layers of your end container um, as and again it's the same even with just uh, you know layer thicknesses uh, and cooling times if they were all different across all of your containers then you wouldn't be able to sell any of your containers because you wouldn't have any sort of homogeneousness in your uh, production capabilities. So after the manifold, the melt flow has to be formed into the parison. In a normal monolayer head, uh, this is a simple process. The plastic is fed into a torpedo insert, uh, which pushes the material out to a gap between the die and the pin in the tooling. But in multi-layer blow molding, getting each layer to its desired thickness and position within the parison is much more complex. Each layer on the parison requires an individual insert, and the design of the insert is going to be based on the parameters of your materials. Um, the insert forms the melt flow into a ring, uh, and in this case, the ring can be very thin, as little as 1% of the overall wall thickness of the container. Uh, its diameter is based on its place within the final parison, and the tolerances are extremely precise. Variations in the thickness or diameter of a fraction of a millimeter can have adverse effects on the final container's appearance or usability. Uh, here, we use two main styles of insert, a dual heart-shaped pinola, uh, which is designed primarily for polyethylene-type materials, and a spiral type pinola, which is used to prevent knit lines in materials that have a sort of memory effect, like polypropylene, which tries to uh, return to its original shape uh, after it's been melted. The inserts are stacked together for each parison with the innermost layer on the top and the outermost layer on the bottom. The flow channels of the inserts have to be aligned in a way to form the layers into their desired thickness while also allowing the layer above it to flow freely as it has already been formed, uh, which you'll see in this short video that I have. It's just a small simulation of uh, how the multi-layer parison is formed inside of an extrusion head. So you'll see we'll take apart our manifold plates at first, um, you can see that this is the manifold plate for the inner layer, virgin material. Uh, it's being fed from its own separate horizontal extruder in this case, and then formed uh, along the first pinola. Uh, then on top of it, our middle layer, which in this case is post-consumer recycled material or production regrind, is then going to be formed Again, the same manifold, just different plates from its own separate main layer extruder, um, but over its panola and then over the inner layer. So you can see how tight the tolerances have to be there. And then in this case, we'll also follow it up with our outer layer, which in this case is also virgin material mixed with color or master batch. Uh, same basic process but it has a longer distance to go from its extruder and it has to be extruded and formed in the parison over the layers underneath it so incredibly tight tolerances uh, but the end reward of a multi-layer container is well worth the differences in design and cost over a monolayer material this is a little added bit showing a view stripe which is important for a lot of our uh, container manufacturers and converters that are in the crowd. Uh, normally, a view stripe is kind of seen as being incompatible with a multi-layer container, not being able to cut through all three of the layers, so you wouldn't be able to see what's on the inside. But in our case and how we uh, manufacture our heads and the precision that we use, it is absolutely possible to have a view stripe in a monolayer or multi-layer container. So in this case, you saw that the end result was a three-layer parison with a view stripe that would be formed into a three-layer container. Um, other things to note with special applications before we move into another portion of this presentation, um, typically discontinuous blow molding, uh, blow molding which uses accumulators, is 
perfectly compatible with multi-layer technology. By using multiple accumulators, which are positioned in such a way to allow them to provide the adequate bursts of material across all of the necessary parisons, you can adopt multiple layers with larger and more complex containers, which often represent higher material and cost savings. Um, as well as uh, another application of our multi-layer technology is having a gradated container. Uh, you can use a ring distributor, we call it, across two layers and delay the formation of the outermost layer into the parison, effectively leaving the top layer exposed. You can use this for layering for different color combinations, and it's a particularly effective way to make your container stand out on the shelf without having to pay for shrink wrapping. So you can see that the deco, the decoration layer, was sort of added in a delayed way um, to get this color, this black color or this darker red color on the bottom of these containers. The next thing we're going to talk about are the different layer configurations uh, that are used in today's markets. And this is an expanding topic as new people find new and innovative ways to use our multi-layer technology to make the best possible containers for their product. We try to keep ourselves up to date on what our customers are doing and what we're hoping to achieve alongside them. So a little bit of a chemistry lesson to start. There are important considerations for material usage about what layer structures you wanna use. So for example, if you just wanna add some PCR or production regrind to your HDPE bottle, uh, you can use a simple two layer head configuration. One layer for the outer virgin decoration material and one layer for the PCR the pressure and heat created in the extrusion head will bond the layers together easily, although they might still be distinguishable underneath a microscope. In this case, the polyethylene uh, neatly mates to the polyethylene in the other layer. Um, but what if you wanted to use a different type of material than polyethylene? Let's say you wanted to add a vinyl alcohol barrier to an ordinary HDPE flask so that it can withstand the use of more aggressive chemicals. At first glance, it seems like you could also use a two-layer head for this, one for the HDPE and one for your barrier material. But vinyl alcohol and HDPE do not have the correct chemical properties to bond together. The materials will extrude together in the parison, but after cooling, the bottle will delaminate or the layers will separate and ruin your container. So we need to introduce an adhesive to bond the layers together. In this case, the adhesive is an anhydride modified linear low density polyethylene resin that can bond to both HDPE and to vinyl alcohol. Uh, this means that instead of the two layer configuration that you might have initially thought you needed, you actually needed a three layer con uh, configuration and a three layer extrusion head. And this guarantees the durability of the bottle against delamination. There are many different layer structures and material configurations as there are potential container applications. Uh, pretty commonly, we tend to see seven different layer structures as they have been optimized for popular applications. The first we call DECO, short for decoration. Uh, it is a two-layer application that consists of an outer layer that is a virgin material with an expensive color or decoration material. And then you have a PCR or production regrind inner layer. Uh, this type of layer structure enables manufacturers to process a higher amount of recycled material without compromising the appearance of their container or they can use it just to save money on the expensive decoration materials or master batch. So this is also what you would use, for example, if you had a soft touch material on the exterior of your container. Instead of having to make the entire container out of this expensive soft touch material, you can simply make the outer layer, which could be less than 10% of the container uh, out of this soft touch material and save money there. The second is a basic three-layer configuration, which we call RACO. Uh, it is 
by far the most popular of our configurations, um, and it's pretty easy to see why based on the benefits that it gives. It typically consists of an exterior decoration layer uh, and a PCR or uh, production regrind layer in the middle, as well as a virgin inner layer for contact of the material. So some applications in personal care, in medication, in food and beverage, Again, they either don't allow by regulation or companies aren't comfortable having whatever they're filling the bottle with come in contact with PCR or production regrind. So having that inner virgin layer uh, allows you to use these types of material savings and use recycled materials, but doesn't allow the container to come in contact with you know, these types of materials. And that can be pretty important. Next, uh, we come into the first of our coax layer structures. Um, coax is kind of the terminology that we use to talk about layer structures that use adhesives to bond the similar layers together, like I talk about in our short chemistry demonstration. This four layer application allows you to preserve the contents of your container using a barrier layer while also benefiting from the cost savings of having a PCR or regrind layer and the aesthetic benefits of a virgin outer layer. And commonly used barriers include, like I talked about, ethyl vinyl alcohol, which is commonly known as EVOH, or polyamide, PA, or nylon. The next configuration that makes use of a barrier material to prevent oxygen or moisture from entering the container, um, but in this case, the, mid, the contents of the container can't come in direct contact with whatever the barrier material is. But to prevent this, we remove the PCR or regrind layer, and then we replace it with a virgin layer on the inside of the container. However, because we ran into that problem earlier where the virgin HTPE won't properly bond with our barrier material, we also have to have a second layer of adhesive. So we have sort of a sandwich in the middle. Uh, you know, you have uh, bread made out of polyethylene, and then you have meat or cheese that's made out of your barrier material, and your condiments are going to be these two layers of adhesives on either side. Building on the COEX-5 application, the COEX-6 adds PCR regrind uh, to either side of the barrier and adhesive layers for improved sustainability through recycled material usage. Since most applications allow you to use at least production scrap in the container, this option is pretty significantly more popular than COEX-5. So again, this is COEX-5, um, but we're also adding they are regrind or post-consumer recycled material back into the mix. And you can see here that the regrind layer can be on either side of the barrier or adhesive layer. So you can have the regrind material closer to the inside of the container or closer to the outside, which might have an impact if you want to add a little bit of colorant to the regrind uh, so that you have a more bold color on the exterior of your container. COEX-7 is sort of the ultimate realization of multi-layer blow molding technologies. It combines all of the properties a container could need with the most efficient material usage possible. Uh, the bottle that's illustrated here is capable of preserving its contents for an extended period of time while also using a large amount of recycled material and minimizing the usage of expensive decoration materials and colorants. Um, so it's pretty much the same as, as COEX-6, except we've also uh, included a UV barrier, which in this case would be a high carbon content black color uh, to help prevent spoilage or reaction due to sunlight for whatever is inside of the container. Again, just like with COEX-6, the PCR or regrind layer can be on either side of the barrier or adhesives, closer to the exterior of the bottle or closer to the interior. There are other special applications within blow molding that necessitate some modifications to our standard layer structure. 
that building on the basic Reiko configuration, you can, instead of having a regrind layer in the middle, a normal regrind layer, uh, you can use a mechanically or chemically foamed uh, regrind layer for an even bigger material savings, as well as reducing the weight of the container or increasing the top load tolerance. So by foaming your melt, flow, um, you can inject it just into that middle layer so that you get the benefits of the weight savings and the increased top load tolerance, uh, but you don't affect the contact with the material on the inside of the container or the aesthetic properties of the material because you have those inner and outer virgin layers still intact. Uh, COEX 3 fulfills an interesting application. Instead of having the barrier material on the inside of the container uh, to isolate the contents of the of the bottle, uh, you instead put the barrier on the outside of the container. Uh, and this has a very cool aesthetic property. Um, it helps add a glossy sheen and depth to the surface color of the container. So for brands that have an easily recognizable color, let's say the red color that's used in Revlon uh, cosmetics packaging, uh, you can not only help to bring out this color and make it more bold by adding a little bit of depth on the outside using this barrier material, but you can also protect the color during transport. When packages would rub up against each other during the transport process, uh, instead of rubbing away at the at the very thin layer of color that's on the outside of the container, uh, they would instead be rubbing away a little bit at this translucent barrier material. Uh, and that has tons of benefits, uh, you know, if your brand, again, has just an especially uh, famous color that's commonly associated with your products. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's absolutely possible to integrate a view stripe into multi-layered container design as well. Uh, a view stripe is not only an easy way to add shelf value to your product, but also to indicate to consumers when it's time to repurchase in the case of consumable products. So precision insert housing design allows us to insert the transparent view stripe material only into the outermost layers of the packaging. So when we split it apart like this, and you see all of the layers sort of set side by side, you can see that our view stripe only affects, in this case, the outer virgin decoration layer and the outer regrind layer uh, in this six layer container. Because the adhesive barrier and contact layers are already transparent, they're made out of transparent material, we don't have to interrupt them with the view stripe. And thus we preserve the protective qualities of the container. You know, we're not cutting through any of the essential barrier layers or adhesive layers. So your product inside the container is not getting spoiled uh, and your bottle's not falling apart because it doesn't have enough adhesive. Uh, but at the same time, you know, your con end consumer is still able to peer into the inside of the bottle and see, oh, it's time to purchase more. Oh, oh, this is the product that I'm looking for. It has the correct viscosity, the correct color, the correct uh, whatever properties your end product might have. So we've added shelf value and we've kept our protective qualities intact uh, through the use of precision engineering. So what does something like this mean in terms of real world material cost savings? Uh, let's do some quick math to find out. On a six Parison head, so a head that can produce uh, six containers at the same time uh, with a 60 millimeter maximum die diameter, like that that's commonly found in family sized personal care products, uh, specifically you know, shampoo and body wash bottles, uh, your throughput is around 360 kilograms an hour of material. At 90% uptime, which is a very conservative estimate for machines that are equipped with our W. Muller extrusion heads, that's around 7,885 hours a year. Uh, we multiply these two together very simply to get our rough output a year. Uh, in this case, uh, 2,858,600 kilograms of material used 
a year. If we simply replace 60% of the mass of the container with post-consumer recycled materials, uh, so leaving 20% on the outside layer for aesthetic properties and 20% on the inside layer for protective properties, uh, then we use 1.7 million kilograms less virgin material every year. And this is just on one extrusion head, right? This is this is one six parison 60 millimeter extrusion head that's making one bottle. So in a typical factory, which might have 10 to 15 of these types of heads, you can start to see that huge multiplicative difference in virgin material usage. Uh, in layman's terms, uh, this weight is equal to 26 of the space shuttle discovery, which is a little a tidbit for our American listeners here, just to give you an idea of how astronomical the material usage saving is just by switching out a simple component of your production cycle, switching from a monolayer to a multi-layer extrusion head. Finally, let's take a look at some more specific applications. So how do these different layer structures and specialized technologies impact existing markets? Chronologically, this question is best answered in reverse. Product demands are what led to the introduction of these specific layer structures, and as such, they've already had a huge prod, um, impact on products in the store shelves. So take, for example, in food and beverage, our six-layer uh, coax structure, which, as we learned earlier, provides significant room for regrind or PCR usage and properly isolates its contents from the environment. Uh, this popular water flavor enhancer, uh, which was put out by the Coca-Cola brand, had issues related to flavor preservation and thus its shelf life. You know, they couldn't continue to keep products stocked on the shelf and sell it if it still didn't taste like how it was supposed to. Uh, so having experienced that isolating the product from atmospheric conditions would significantly increase the shelf life, the company's packaging engineers chose to go with a six-layer configuration. This way, they could reduce the profit loss that comes naturally with product waste, and they could meet sustainable goals uh, by having the package be 51% of the container's volume is now made up of recycled material. As demonstrated on this uh, illustration on the right-hand side, you can see under a microscope all six of the layers very clearly. You can see that the majority of the container is made up of that regrind layer. And you can see that only very little of the material is the barrier and inner and outer adhesives. That's all you need, just that little bit uh, to get much better shelf life and flavor and visual preservation of your content. You don't have to, you know, slather on 10 or 15 percent of the container's mass as part of this barrier. And these barrier materials are very expensive. So being able to use very little of them is a big benefit to converters and distributors who would end up selling these bottles to brands like the Coca-Cola company. In the personal care segment, uh, there's a similar story. Brands in this segment often use bold colors to distinguish their products on the shelves. Uh, Old Spice is red, Aussie products are purple, Dove has its uh, you know, famous sort of matte Dove gray, and so on. These colorants, though, are significantly expensive. Uh, to create a bottle that uses only a single layer of colored material um, can be five or six times more expensive than if you didn't use any coloration at all. So a way to sensibly maintain your strong shelf presence while saving the cost on colors is to use multiple layers. Uh, two layers, our deco application, would be perfectly acceptable in this case, but again, most of these companies opt for three-layer technologies so that they can increase their usage of production regrind and PCR. Uh, HDPE and LDPE, uh, if you mix them together, don't require the use of adhesives. So. As you can see, in this case, their uh, post-consumer regrind might be you know, high-density and low-density polyethylene mixed together, and they don't have to do any type of special process uh, 
post the recycling sorting to be able to get the bottle to not delaminate and to maintain its aesthetic properties. Uh, for a gradated design, like I talked about earlier, um, you can differentiate yourself using two-tone colors. Um, by using the ring distributor that we had talked about, uh, you can again delay the formation of the outermost layer uh, until a specific portion of the bottle. And this is a particularly effective combination in this case because the base layer is clear. So you can see that the, the blue material on the top isn't actually any type of colorant or master batch at all. That's the shampoo that's on the inside of the container. The only coloration used in the container is the white coloration at the bottom. And that gives it a strong presence on the store shelf. This is a very well-designed uh, piece of packaging, but it also indicates to the consumer, hey, I'm running out of shampoo. I need to go back to the store and buy more of this brand of shampoo without the need for introducing a view stripe into the container. It's, pre it's pretty plain to see when you're running low and you haven't had to cut into the comparison at all. So two layers, a white layer and a clear layer and using a colored cap and in this case a colored product on the inside makes for a great piece of packaging design. And again, the emphasis on color comes to the extreme in the cosmetics industry. Um, when your product itself is some form of colorant, like makeup, right? Your packaging has to have a luxurious or playful feel to it. The consumer has these types of expectations based on what kind of product is inside the packaging. And again, an effective way to highlight and protect the color of your packaging is by placing this barrier on the exterior of the bottle. So in this case, the customer decided to use EVOH uh, since it provides the depth between the color and the edge of the container and gives it that nice full glossy effect as you can see in the pictures here. It also protects the color in the case of rough handling and logistics. Uh, worth mentioning, you could achieve this same result using a five layer structure as well and add regrind or PCR into the center of your container uh, as well as virgin non-colored material on the very inside. Uh, this would be a more upfront expense but would save material and colorant costs significantly and you would be able to uh, you know, say to your consumer that we're using a more sustainable packaging design which consumers greatly care about. Agrochemical applications like pesticides or lawn treatments often make use of vinyl or nylon barriers as the contact layer, allowing for one less adhesive layer. But because chemical companies traditionally have much more stringent sustainability expectations due to the type of product that they make and consumer concern, most tend to utilize a massive regrind and PCR layer, reducing their material usage, their virgin material usage, to just the thinnest possible outer declaration layer. So you can see they went with a four layer in the case of this uh, popular lawn care pesticide, um, and most of the bottle is that big interior regrind layer that has just a tiny bit of coloration added to it. Most of the color is in the outer virgin HDPE layer, and they have just one adhesive and one barrier layer that comes in direct contact with the pesticide on the inside. There's no chemical uh, or off-gassing problems related to that, so they're able to isolate the contents, protect the consumers, and make much more sustainable packaging. Uh, petroleum is the most commonly derived product from crude oil. Uh, fuel is used to transport energy production, heating. It accounts for over 80% of all crude oil usage. And just 40 years ago, fuel was primarily transported in steel tanks, which were both heavy and difficult to produce on a level that met increasingly strict safety and emissions regulations. But there was a problem. The walls of a plastic tank were not dense enough to protect oxygen from continually coming into contact with the fuel. Because fuel has a very low flash point of just negative 45 degrees centigrade, constant contact with oxygen causes vaporization and off-gassing. 
So fuel vapors not only pressurize the tank, but they leak into the surrounding air. And this is a huge safety concern, both in terms of flammability and in terms of having consumers breathe in fuel vapors. Originally, this problem was addressed with fluorinating the inside of the tanks. The tanks would have a carbon fluorine solution, such as CTF, sprayed onto their interiors, which is both extremely dense and prevented vapor leaks, and it's chemically inert. So there was no type of reaction uh, between the fuel, the plastic of the packaging, or the air. But then a new problem comes into effect. The fluorination process is traditionally outsourced to third-party companies meaning that it is both incredibly expensive for a converter or fuel tank manufacturer, and it has huge negative environmental repercussions due to the need to mass transport the tanks to and from the fluorination facility. As a result, fuel tank makers have started to adopt the same coax six layer technologies that the food and beverage industry uses. Uh, as it turns out, EVOH is not only an excellent barrier for oxygen and moisture, uh, but also to prevent the off-gassing of hydrocarbons like petroleum. A six-layer fuel tank can therefore be produced in a single process. Uh, like majority of extrusion blow molded parts with all of its protective properties intact and incorporating a huge percentage of recycled materials, all at a fraction of the cost of fluorinated monolayer plastic fuel tanks. A view stripe can even be integrated uh, to add shelf value, which, like we mentioned earlier, does not affect the barrier or adhesive coverage in any way. Thankfully, most petroleum lubricants and additives don't share the same chemical characteristics that gasoline does. So they can be made in simpler configurations that just look to maximize recyclable usage, such as this coax-4 container, uh, which is used in this one quart uh, fuel additive. Um, this is especially important in today's markets where the petroleum industry is consistently under attack from consumers for its role in perceived climate change. Uh, so consumers are constantly looking to outlet on the petroleum and plastics and packaging industries for their parts in climate change. And so by incorporating as much sustainability into your packaging as you can, uh, you seek to protect yourselves from these types of claims. And the one quart oil container industry uh, represents the biggest packaging market for these material savings. It's estimated that about 760 million individually packaged oil quarts are being sold inside the United States every year. So just adding in our quick you know, calculation that we did earlier, with this type of material configuration, uh, that could be 46 million kilograms of virgin material that's saved across the sector annually. The bulk packaging is another market where materials savings add up quickly. Uh, bulk packaging is very large and often rectangular in shape to allow for better transport and rigidity, um, but this packaging is not very efficient in terms of surface area or material usage for a given volume. So multi-layer savings in the, in the term of you know, our multi-layer extrusion technologies, those savings are significant. Uh, this picture here demonstrates what precision multi-layer blow molding looks like. Each of the three individual layers are clearly distinguishable with the naked eye, blue on the exterior, white in the middle, and green on the interior, despite the outer and inner colored layers being less than a millimeter thick each. So if there is variation in the wall thickness, you mitigate your material savings with two thick layers, which cost you more materials, or two thin layers compromising your entire container. That's why it's so important to have you know, a respectable uh, precision design that's built on experience. Uh, pharmaceutical packaging cannot, in pretty much every circumstance, have recycled material in it in the U.S., but that doesn't mean it's not an excellent place to incorporate multilayer technology. An excellent example is this container right here, which uses three different virgin materials to maximize shelf life value and extend the lifespan of the contents. The inner layer is a white desiccant, 
which absorbs the moisture, which would otherwise degrade the pharmaceuticals inside the container. The middle layer is standard HTPE, and the outer layer uses a low-density polyethylene mixed with a type of blue rubber soft-touch material, uh, which has a finish that allows you to increase grip, making it easier for people with arthritis or other types of hand problems, uh, easier to open and close the container. So you can see, even though we didn't take sustainability into account uh, because of the market that we're in, uh, by utilizing our multi-layer technology, we were able to bring more value to both the container and the end consumer. So in conclusion, while sustainability is the primary use for multi-layer blow molding, adding value and quality to packaging is easily done uh, using the systems that we've demonstrated today. A number of the world's most iconic brands have already shifted to mostly layer blow molded containers. So brands like the Coca-Cola company, like Nestle, like Procter & Gamble, like Unilever, they're already utilizing these technologies not only to their great benefit but to the, the, yeah, to the benefit of consumers worldwide and to the environment as a whole. The flexibility of multi-layer blow molding provides a platform for endless packaging innovation both in design and in function. And while multi-layer blow molding is a decades old and proven technology to save materials and money, current utilization is just the tip of the iceberg. Every day we're finding customers or requests or their usage of their existing machinery that allows them to incorporate new strategies into their packaging design and make much more clever use of recycled materials, of barrier materials, of expensive colorants and master batch, of other decoration type materials. Uh, this is just the beginning and so I hope that everybody who has shown up to today's show not only now has a, a better familiarity with the process and with our company as the pioneers of the process, but also have started to formulate in your heads a clever use of multi-layer extrusion blow molding that could be used to make something more sustainable, more accessible, better for the environment, and better for your bottom line. So thank you all very much for listening to me for the past 45 minutes or so, and now we'll get into the fun portion. Uh, I'll throw it back over to Matt for questions and answers, and as always, uh, you can scan this QR code to stay up to date with W. Muller USA on LinkedIn, and always thank W. Muller uh, internationally for all of your extrusion blow molding needs. Uh, thank you, Matt. All right. Well, thank you, Elijah. And I'm, I must say you've uh, got a very motivated audience here. I think I see more questions than I'm used to seeing. I hope we can get through uh, most of them. Uh, a number of them relate to uh, to uh, multi-layer, uh, excuse me, to, well, one of them I think you answered that concerned fluorination. Uh, one of your people asked about that. And uh, I could just add that if you go on our website, uh, ptonline.com, and, and search on fluorination, you will find articles on, on that uh, as well. Then uh, I think you also kind of answered a question about recycling, which is that you said people could save money by using their regrind, um, but then the question came up, well, uh, there's, you talked a lot about PCR, but nowadays PCR is as expensive or even more expensive to use than than virgin, so why so much emphasis on that? And I think you indicated that the sustainability is what's motivating that. Um, so moving on to other things um, related to recycling, uh, the question is, what about recycling multi-layer bottles or containers? How recyclable are they? Yeah, so that's an, that's an excellent question. So if you're for example, using a two or a three layer container, you know, that's completely polyethylene. Uh, obviously you can just stamp the recycle code for polyethylene on the bottom and there'll be no problem in traditional mainstream recycling sorting methods. Um, they'll be able to process and reclaim that material and repelletize it as normal. For materials that use barriers uh, and adhesives and other types of more novelty or exotic materials. Uh, traditionally, these parts have had to be stamped with a number seven, which is an other, uh, you know, designation for material usage. Um, and in the past, that's been sort of stigmatizing. That's essentially meant that based on the conventional recycling streams that, oh, this material, this container is not really going to be 
recyclable. Um, but there have been two methods that have come up in the past years that sort of have mended that. Uh, the first is that uh, in a lot of, for example, agricultural uh, uses, which make use of barrier and, and adhesive materials in the use of pesticides and insecticides, uh, that there are mandated uh, reclaiming methods that, that governments, especially in Latin America, will use to get these bottles out of the farms. So it's mandatory for the companies that produce the containers to reclaim them. And by converting a COEX-4 layer structure into a COEX-5 or 6 layer structure, which includes extra regrind, uh, you can regrind the whole bottle, barrier and adhesive usage uh, included and put that into the regrind layer of a new bottle. So for production scrap and for PCR, that's one simple way to do it is by having the container manufacturers also be responsible for the reclamation of the bottles. Uh, the other way is there are some pretty advanced hydro sorting recycling methods that are able to, you know, once the granules of the bottle are shredded thinly enough and, and you know, almost kind of microscopic in scale, uh, they have the adhesives in the barrier layers have different densities than the polyethylenes. So by using these very, uh, you know, um, using, using these very advanced hydro emulsifying methods, um, you know, you come into you come into play there, where they can sort out the barriers and adhesives without even having to separate the process mechanically. Um, and especially in your in Europe and Asia and Africa and the United States, if you are 95%, uh, you know, high density polyethylene, your container is is considered fully recyclable the the just the little bit of adhesive and barrier layers uh, don't count. Okay. Um, well, here's a question. Uh, if if you're using PCR in a container, is there any concern that there might be something in the PCR that might uh, migrate through to the the interior contents of say that, that it was a food container or something like that, even if you have a uh, virgin inner layer? Sure. So if you have a virgin inner layer and, and you've done kind of the, the proper testing of this type of layer configuration for your specific application, uh, there's no threat of migration of contamination from the PCR or, uh, you know, post-industrial scrap to the inside of the container. Um, it's uh, just because the layers are all mechanically formed separately, right? They don't come into contact with each other until they're being squeezed into that final parison. Uh, there's no way that you can cross-contaminate it, provided, of course, that all of the other parameters in your production facility are set up correctly. You have, you know, your separate hoppers and you're not cross-loading and you're not transporting everything in one big box. So no no threat of contamination there. And that's why it's especially well regarded in uh, the areas of cosmetics and personal care. Okay. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> there are just so many questions here. Uh, there was one. Uh, is there any limitation on the number of parisons one can use with uh, multi-layer blow molding? Nope, it's uh, the same as whatever you could do in monolayer blow molding. So we personally, you know, as our company, I believe, have built heads up to up to 16 parisons um, that incorporate, you know, multi-layer blow molding, specifically our Reiko three-layer blow molding technologies. So whatever the physical limitations of monolayer blow molding are, the physical limitations of multi-layer blow molding are the same. Uh, so, yeah, you can have tons of parisons. You can have really large parisons and, and you know, really large volume accumulators. Um, and it's no different from, from monolayer insect that you're making a better product. Okay. Um, with regard to the, the, the issue of something migrating, uh, there's a question. If you were doing a COEX-4 pesticide container, can you put... 100% regrind into uh, the, the regrind layer, or is it better to always mix some virgin in there to stabilize um, the bottle? Yeah, 
yeah, it really depends on sort of how you've uh, qualified your adhesive material. Um, with a lot of the more common adhesive materials like Bynell uh, 4000 series, which are these, you know, uh, linear low density polyethylene type modified materials, um, then sometimes you are better mixing in a small percentage, you know, maybe maybe two to five percent of a virgin material to help with the bonding. But we've absolutely had companies out in out in the field produce bottles with 100 percent PCR in that layer, um, and you know, not run into long-term uh, problems related to contamination. If you, since you, if you have different materials going into a multi-layer uh, product, how do you maintain different temperatures for the different layers uh, that are appropriate for each material? Yeah, so, um, well, part of it is definitely just having a really precise design. So we use different extruders for each material. Um, you know, and we sort of are regulating the temperatures on the inside of the head just based on our 40 plus years of experience building these uh, solutions. You know, it's uh, we understand where to put the heat and, uh, you know, where it's important to, to have less heat or more heat in terms of making sure to prevent degradation of some of these more exotic materials and it all just comes down to experience because we've been doing this for so long um a, a let's say an upstart you know who's who's trying to sort of home build the style of application right which isn't realistic but i'll just talk about it quickly anyways they might find that they're able to get a sort of multi-layered parison at the end of whatever extrusion head that they build but they would run into just huge problems with delamination they would run into huge problems with uh, unmelt um, and other types of uh, of problems inside the particular flow channels of the head so having flow channel diameters that ensure a, you know a proper pressure for each material um, that also has a lot to do with the residual time which prevents degradation of the material so our heads from an industry perspective have the lowest residual times uh, of any extrusion head that you'd be able to find on the market um, and that is part of our great success is getting material in and out through the head quickly uh, so that we can prevent any type of heat related degradation now, you mentioned you use a different extruder for each layer, um, but the qu a question was raised whether if you were doing a three-layer container with, say, the same material on the inside and the outside, would you want to have three extruders or would you do it with two? You would want three. You can do it with two, and in the past, uh, you know, people and other companies have done it with two, but it's never what we recommend because you always want to be able to have <clears throat> that specific amount of control over your melt flow process, and particularly in the three-layer application, you only want to put color into the outermost layer of the container. You don't want any color on the inside, on the other side of your recycled material because no one will see it and you're just wasting expensive master batch that way. So we always recommend, even for layers which seem like they could be easily duplicated, we always recommend having a specific extruder for each layer and having you know, a, a control solution that reflects being able to properly customize and uh, you know, change the parameters for each layer individually. Okay. Um, PET came up. Can you combine PET with high-density polyethylene in a multi-layer bottle? Um, I suppose that using a proper adhesive um, that you could. I don't see why you would combine PET with HDPE, but you could, for example, combine PET with a type of, uh, you know, with, with a type of uh, light barrier material or a different type of stained, you know, color. Uh, mm -hmm. But typically, typically PET has kind of, it, it has such a composite sort of use of chemical properties, you know, that using it by itself is, is you know, again, the most common types of packaging are monolayer PET, but, but you can absolutely, if you have a specific application that requires you to uh, sort of extend the shelf life of your product, 
but you don't want to put a shrink wrap on it, uh, then you can use other types of barriers and materials in that way. But PET and HDPE doesn't make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two questions about uh, foaming, and maybe I can combine them into one question, and, and that is uh, how much uh, weight can you save through foaming, and, um, and why does foaming improve top load strength? Sure. So I'll answer the first question first, which it, it depends on the container. Uh, it depends on the structural rigidity of the container. It depends on how thick your middlemost layer can be. Uh, and it depends on kind of the quality of the material you use in the mechanical foaming process. So we've seen, we've seen you know, up to 40% savings in total mass of a container. Um, but it's really dependent on the container's design uh, and the materials being used. The second question is more interesting on why foaming, making the material lighter, increases the top load tolerances, because that's sort of a, uh, you know, not a very intrinsic piece of knowledge. But when you look at it closely at a mechanically foamed you know, at like styrofoam or something like that, uh, the little air bubbles and pockets of gas actually work to form a lattice structure. So like a, you know, like a lattice that might be used uh, in a bridge or, or, or in the supports of a large structure. Uh, typically you see it made out of triangles, but it, you, can com you can use the same type of architectural uh, properties with the with the circular or ovular air bubbles in the container. So that actually works to create a lattice. And as we know, lattices are very strong in compression. So they make for better top load tolerance on bottles. And we've seen, I think, upwards of 15% or more uh, increase in top load in the testing that we've done with, with mechanical foaming. Okay. Well, I have uh, one uh, listener who's, who's asked this question twice, so I'll try to squeeze it in. He, he's interested in whether you have ever heard of using polyketone in a multi-layer bottle. It, it has, he's heard that it has very high barrier properties. Um, it's, it might be, that might be a material that has a, a more common name based on a brand or something like that, where there might be a brand name. I don't know what that particular material is off of the top of my head, but uh, as you can see, there's our, our, you know, my email address and in it, our web address. Um, mm -hmm. And we're absolutely, uh, you know, you can absolutely reach out to us more directly and I can have a, a proper engineer provide an answer to that. As well, I think that you, Matt, if I'm correct, will be providing us all of these questions at the end. Yeah. So. So any questions we don't get to or don't have the proper answer for, we'll be able to to reach out with a good answer. Excellent, excellent. Um, there was a question about whether you can adjust the, uh, let me see if I can find it here, the the layer. Uh, let me see. Uh, well, well, all right, I'll find that one later. But here's the question. Um, does the presence of a, of a view stripe reduce the mechanical burst pressure of a, uh, of a, of a container, say, if it were a fuel tank, for example? Nope, um, because typically in terms of your strength against, so burst is you're measuring tension on the interior walls of the container. And typically your strong point for tension in a material is, is gonna be sort of, is gonna be HDPE in these cases. Uh, so because the, view stripe is going to be commonly made out of HDPE and it's going to be inserted and bond mechanically exactly into those outermost HDPE layers. Uh, there's no difference than having it or not having it in terms of the in terms of the burst strength of the container. You're not going to blow out your view stripe. Okay. Here's I found what I was looking for. I think this should be an easy one for you. Can we program and change Parison thickness in real time? Uh, using our technologies, yes, you can. Uh, you can adjust the the profile with the uh, with your wall thickness control cylinder, your die gap, everything like that can be done in real time uh, through the use of our control solution and and our extrusion heads. And that's whether it's a hydraulic or a servo electric 
uh, solution, depending on what type of low molding machine you're putting on. So, so absolutely, you can control all of these variables. You know, heat pressure timings, you know, cycle timings, uh, wall thickness in real time, as well as through the use of uh, some of our, you know, partner technologies. So, for example, we are partnered with a company based out of our area in Germany in the Rhineland called Feuerham. Uh, which makes a technology called PWDS, um, Partial mm -hmm. Wall Distribution System, I think it stands for. I, uh, and it's um, and it's a by using a deformable die, mm -hmm. um, they are able to you know in real time and in fractions of seconds and things like that you know move the distribution of material along the walls of the container so that you have more structural rigidity in some parts of the container and you know where you don't need it you can save material by taking the material out um, so that's a, a really really cool technology and a huge advancement on you know the real-time uh, manipulation of the parison okay well look we, we've gone uh, several minutes past the hour there's still quite a number of questions but I hope you can get back to them uh, via email or, or however, since you, you will have access to all these. So I want to thank uh, you and I want to thank uh, the audience for their, their questions. Um, and uh, to remind everybody that uh, uh, the webinar has been recorded and it will be available uh, by tomorrow or even sooner uh, on our website and you will all get an email uh, linking you to the recording um, within uh, a couple of hours, I hope. Um, so the next uh, plastics technology webinar will be tomorrow at 2 p.m. when Conair will present Speed Controlled Conveying Protects Resin and Eliminates Angel Hair. So that could be under, of general interest. And for more details, look under the Events tab on our website, www.ptonline.com. So thank you again, Elijah, and thank you to the audience for attending today's webinar. I hope it was valuable and gives you some ideas on how to improve your company's efficiency and competitiveness. So thanks again, and good afternoon. Thanks, everybody, and stay safe.